Welcome to Silver Oaks quarterly webinar. My name is Shannon King and I'm president, partner and chief compliance officer. And with me today is Jonathan Charlo, also a partner of the, the, uh, the firm and our lead analyst. Good morning. Uh, Jonathan, are you with us? I am with you. All right. Well, if uh, everyone doesn't know already, we're still under our business continuity plan, which means that some of us, many of us are working remotely. So Jonathan and I are doing this again in separate locations uh, to stay safe and uh, continue to uh, adhere to our COVID protocols. Nonetheless, we are looking forward to today's webinar and discussing the economic activity of the third quarter and looking forward to uh, the fourth quarter as well. Like most webinars, we will transition from the economic data to the market data and then discuss Silver Oak's outlook for both the economy and the markets going forward. We'll walk through our perspectives on current market trends and actually review the Biden tax proposals. As everyone knows, I'm sure um, you tuned in to last night's debate between the president and former vice president. So we'll talk about what tax rules may be changing if uh, the formal, former uh, vice president gets elected. And then we'll give you some other Silver Oak updates and important items. Before we go into that though, as usual, today's webinar is gonna last approximately 45 to 60 minutes. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to contact your Silver Oak advisor after the session. If you're not working with a Silver Oak advisor, you can contact me directly at 952-896-5701. And of course, uh, Jonathan, thank you for putting the materials together along with John and the rest of Silver Oak's team for making this uh, webinar possible. And for compliance reasons, I must note that we will be discussing the overall markets and economy during this webinar. And in doing so, we'll be providing our interpretations and perspectives. You should not rely upon this information though as fact when making any investment decisions. And of course, we've already sent out the quarterly performance reports to all of our clients. Uh, since all of our portfolios are customized, we will not be discussing specific Silver Oak portfolio performance. Nonetheless, if our clients have any questions, I encourage you to reach out to your advisor if they haven't already done so in reaching out to you. And lastly, past performance is no guarantee of future success. So let's talk about the economy, Jonathan. And you say here that it was recovering during the third quarter. Uh, can you explain that a little bit more? Sure, sure. sure. So, so certainly the economy has come back strongly in the third quarter. But the reality is we're, we're not back to full capacity. There are still social distancing measures in place and many of the consumer oriented industries are still impacted. So you're gonna see some conflicting uh, data in the next few slides, but we are running from an economic standpoint much higher than we were in the second quarter, but there are still some outstanding questions. Sure, and we see that really here with our dashboard. So. Uh, just to reiterate how our dashboard works for, for those that maybe haven't attended a webinar in the past, we break the dashboard into four major categories. Here you're seeing the economy, and we're essentially trying to do a, a kind of a heat map to show how the economy is uh, behaving. If the quarter is green, that means it's positive. If the quarter shown has a gray box, that's more neutral and red is obviously negative. Um, so as we look at the economy being the first component of the dashboard, we can see that the third quarter, the economy was negative, red. 
but from data that we're projecting and the trends that we're seeing, this is saying, Jonathan, that we anticipate e the economy component of the dashboard to go back neutral and potentially even positive mid 2021. Correct. Correct. And, and things that you know we're seeing are leading indicators, housing data, employment getting a little bit better, uh, and the idea that uh, corporate earnings will rebound. Okay. So that's the economy, that one fourth of the dashboard. The other component of the dashboard are the credit markets. And obviously in the first quarter, we saw those go uh, big time negative. Uh, as a matter of fact, in late March, maybe early April, we saw the credit markets completely freeze up and the Federal Reserve really having to step in with some significant monetary policy. Um, we are projecting though, that that is going to ease in the third quarter and, and go back to more of a neutral stance. Although uh, maybe there's a theme in this, in this uh, webinar, Jonathan, and maybe the theme is less bad because I mean, we're saying neutral, but we're really bouncing off some really bad numbers. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, on the next couple of slides, we're gonna see some factors that are a little bit better, but they're still actually pretty bad still. Okay. But even in the credit markets, we're projecting sometime mid next year to go back to more favorable conditions. Correct. The third component of the dashboard are valuations. And, and these remain negative. And frankly, we see these continuing to be negative throughout the first part of next year. And what we mean by negative with valuations is that the market may be as higher than the overall fundamentals would otherwise suggest. So maybe you might consider it as quasi overpriced. Now, we've talked a lot about this in the past. I know, Jonathan, you really uh, stress this, that we can go a long time with very high valuations and not necessarily get market corrections. Absolutely. Okay. And then the fourth component and the last final component of the dashboard is market sentiment. And, and this, again, we're seeing, at least we're expecting, right, that that third quarter came in more positive and that's you know all the data that we've gathered thus far on the third quarter is showing that it came in much more positive and went from negative in the second quarter really bouncing off those bottoms um, pretty dramatically and continuing to be more positive throughout the rest of this quarter and into next year so if we bring it all together our six-month composite average still though is negative and is projected to remain negative throughout the first part of next year. So again, we're seeing some positive trends, but not enough really to move the overall composite even into a neutral kind of territory until mid next year. If we look at the trailing dashboard, what we're seeing here is the current and the six month composite numbers going back all the way to the 1990s. That's the kind of orangish and greenish uh, lines. And obviously, if you look to the very far right, that's most current, and we're bouncing essentially off the bottom as we've discussed. But that six month composite average is still only at 2.64%, which is well be below what we would call a threshold, which is around 3.25%. So it's moving in the right direction. And sometimes the direction means more than the actual number, but it's still well below a historical threshold that we would look at. Anything there, Jonathan, that you wanna to add to the dashboard? No, no, other than just, of course, if, if many of the economic factors, sentiment factors uh, improve more quickly, we will see the current threshold, um, which is, you know, the current uh, composite number is above the threshold. We can continue to see that increase uh, 
and then we'll see the six month kind of uh, get dragged up as well. Sure. And that could go the other direction as well. And so much of this is all predicated on what's happening with COVID. So, you know, if there's a theme to the webinar, you know, I mentioned less bad that, you know, the data is looking less bad, but another theme would be COVID. Now, all of this is obviously highly predicated on what's happening with COVID and potential further shutdowns or, or you know, the restarts um, maybe slowing in certain states or, or regions. All right, well, let's look at our scorecard then. Um, so we just looked at the dashboard, but here is a list of our scorecard and we can see that so much is kind of skewed more toward the negative and has remained that way for the last uh, several months, couple of quarters since COVID. Um, we did imp see some improvement in, in a couple of these areas. So for example, housing, um, Jonathan, we're showing that that actually was upgraded category. So it had been neutral in our last webinar, uh, but we've shifted it this quarter into positive. Do you want to touch on that? So far, it seems we, we have some pent up demand in the housing market and with historically low interest rates, we've seen activity levels pretty high. Now, of course, we have low uh, supply of housing, so that might have something to do with it. But every recession is a little bit different. And in this case, housing hasn't been Im impacted like it was back in the Great Recession. Sure. Of course, that's, you know, housing we're talking about here, residential. Uh, you know, story is completely different when we talk about commercial real estate. That's That's been beat up pretty bad. And And frankly, even housing, some of the big cities are maybe seeing more negative impacts, whereas this housing is more national looking really across the country, but, you know, pockets like New York City, um, Chicago, LA, some of the more concentrated cities, maybe not as positive as we're indicating here. Now, one area that we've noticed some kind of shift downward in sent sentiment, and that is uh, on fiscal policy. And really, um, the issue with the fiscal policy is whether the two parties are really going to be able to come together and and get another stimulus or same, some people would call a relief package um, put together and, and passed. I think everybody anticipates it's going to happen at some point, but um, timing is is really the question whether it's going to happen before inauguration. Well, really, we were talking about maybe before election. That seems a little bit uh, more problematic, uh, but before, before inauguration or maybe uh, sometime thereafter. Now on the positive, we did see employment and also consumer confidence slightly shift in sentiment upward. Why don't you touch on those, Jonathan? Sure, we'll, we'll show it another slide, but employment numbers have gotten better in the last couple of months but I caution you that we're still well below where we were uh, before the pandemic, and it could take a number of years to get back. And then what we've seen in, in the consumer confidence numbers um, is that they've shifted up a bit more positively in the, in the last couple of months, and that, that's certainly one of the factors in the dashboard which caused sentiment to, to increase. But again, it's one factor among many and we still have a lot of negative factors still. Okay. So walk us through what you call here the strong Q3 rebound. Yeah, so the Atlanta Fed does track uh, GDP uh, during, a, during a quarter. And so what we're showing is the progression of the Atlanta Fed's estimates for the third quarter. And, and so just as a reminder, in, in the second quarter, we saw GDP down more than 30%. And what this is showing, if you look at that green line, as different economic data points were reported, uh, the Atlanta Fed looked at, at their GDP estimates and updated it. And so what you're seeing is a trend upward in the quarter. And uh, as of uh, about a week ago, uh, we're seeing that they, they, they're tracking it at mid-30s. Uh, 
And I think the expectation is, is that it will come in probably at roughly 30%. Okay. And then how about for the year? Do they have estimates for the year? Yeah, yeah. And that that's kind of where we're still, you know, have an issue. They're, they're projecting that GDP for the year will be down 10%. And part of that would be uh, another increase in the fourth quarter of five to 10%. But as many of you are aware, with a lack of fiscal stimulus, with case counts rising, uh, that number could be at risk. Okay. All right. Well, we did see a strong rebound though in durable spending, uh, maybe not so much in services, but uh, well, we did see a rebound in services, but not nearly as much as what we saw in, in durable goods. And we can see that off uh, this chart, green representing the durable goods, um, really, really strong bounce. And you're gonna see that also when we look at some of the uh, industries and sectors that got hit hardest and some that maybe did better over the last quarter or two, such as uh, retail, uh, whereas restaurants and, and some of the other services oriented came back, but not nearly uh, to pre-COVID levels. Another bright spot has been in the PMI. Um, that has bounced up off of its bottoms as well. Is there anything specific though here on the PMI that you want to uh, touch on, Jonathan? Well, we're showing the US numbers, but globally uh, we're, we're seeing that shift. And again, so much of it is because of the uh, bounce that we've seen in durable goods. Okay. And here what we're showing is really the improvement in unemployment. So we obviously were coming off of just crazy numbers. I mean, unemployment had spiked up to, to 14 plus percent. Um, so we've seen a big improvement there. Uh, now in August, uh, the latest numbers, it looks like 8.4% um, coming down. So the trend is the right direction, but we're still well above historical averages and, and frankly, way above pre-COVID levels. So again, it's less bad, but still not necessarily all that great. Why don't you touch on consumer activity and the fact that we have seen a rebound in that as well, but um, maybe that has started to, uh, to flatten out? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you can look at really a lot of different areas. You, you see that initial kind of bounce. And then if you look at the far right, you're going to see things uh, actually kind of uh, tailing off. You know, and again, when, when we're looking at it, we're looking at the bottom, the light blue TSA traveler traffic. Um, so we did see kind of a bounce, but, but still airlines are um, having, you know, very little um, people traveling, certainly not much business uh, travel. When we look at seated dinners, you know, we're still down more than 40%. Overall, uh, navigation for travel is still down 40%. But like we said, housing was strong, and, and there we see uh, mortgage applications up 22%. Hmm. Yeah, that's just hard to believe. I mean, we're in the midst of a once-in-a-century global pandemic, and, and housing has actually uh, bucked the trend on this one. That's it's great to see. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, happy to see it, but it's, it's probably surprising. All right, uh, small business recovery. You say it's at risk. Why do you say that? Well, this is one area that many businesses are still being impacted by social distancing measures. And so what we're tracking is the fact that many have reopened and, and more employees are working, but we're still down 20% from where we started. And the fiscal stimulus that we've talked about that's been delayed uh, that includes uh, the PPP money uh, that many of these businesses might need uh, to make it through the winter um, when economic activity might slow again. Now, to be fair, uh, several weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, I think Jerome Powell and Steven Mnuchin uh, 
testified to Congress, and I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but there's hundreds of millions of dollars that they still have unused from the original um, or last PPP program. So I think there is some uh, frustration that mm -hmm. some of the money that's been allocated just hasn't been used and people are coming back to the trough asking for more. So, you know, give both sides of, sure. of the discussions. Uh, maybe some more fiscal stimulus is needed, but I think there's some arguments that not all of it's even been used from the last package or two. Sure. So if we look here, this really gets to the heart of our next discussion, which is the markets. Um, because really markets are driven off of at least long-term earnings. And you see, you say here that there's going to be a sharp recovery, at least that's expected in earnings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so essentially the 2021 earnings estimates are going to be almost back to what the 2019 earnings uh, were. And, and so interestingly, when you look at that, um, there are huge expectations for consumer discretionary and industrials uh, to rebound 60, 80%. Now on the far right, energy uh, is we have negative earnings this year. So you know from a percentage basis, you know it's somewhat, somewhat infinite. But if the economy comes back, we'll we'll likely see an improvement in the energy earnings. But the other thing I'll I'll point out is that when you look at the S and P 500 in aggregate, they're expecting uh, more than a 20% rebound uh, in earnings. And the other thing too is that while technology, and we'll see that in further slides, has done well this year, uh, it's done well fundamentally and uh, should grow earnings nicely next year as well. But, and, and when we get to that point, you know, Jonathan will talk about how technology makes up a big component of the S&P 500, but not necessarily a big component of GDP or what correct. we think of Main Street. Correct. But, but still, at the end of the day, this is a huge expectation. And if we don't get a vaccine um, early enough in the year, uh, this might be too optimistic. Well, and I think, frankly, we usually, I say we, the industry usually probably starts a little too optimistic uh, anyway. So general trend is maybe we have to ratchet back our expectations uh, most years regardless. Absolutely. All right, well with that then let's transition into the discussion about the markets. Uh, as I said, talking about earnings is a great segue. So how did the markets perform, perform last quarter, Q3, and on a year-to-date basis? So if we look at the equities, the third quarter was a great quarter. Uh, pretty much across the board you're seeing here all positive returns, I'd say very, very solid returns. Unfortunately though, uh, the first six months of the year were just, they were tough to overcome. So pretty much every one of these categories with the exception of the S&P 500 are still negative for the year. Now I will uh, mention that on the international side and even uh, say in the small and mid cap, we had several positions amongst our IQs positions that we utilize in client portfolios that really helped buck the trend on this year-to-date uh, number. So not all of our portfolios had positive international equity returns, but many of them did uh, because we had a couple of really strong performers uh, amongst the positions that we utilize. Um, on the small cap side, our IQs positions in general, again, uh, we saw, although it's still down year to date, most portfolios in the small cap category were down probably half as much. Um, so I know it, it still stinks to be down, but when you're down half as much as the market, there, there is some uh, comfort in that. And, and we did have a couple of mid cap positions even buck the trend as well. So, um, so overall, I think Jonathan, our IQ's positions generally did did quite well. Of course, those that were real value oriented uh, maybe didn't necessarily do uh, do quite as well. In the fixed income category, well, fixed income does what it's supposed to do. Um, 
So we saw third quarter still positive, but not as positive, uh, which is pretty understandable when equity markets are really strong. Bond markets usually aren't quite as strong. But on a year-to-date basis, as we saw earlier, most of those equities were negative year-to-date, whereas bonds are still positive on a year-to-date basis. So they provide that ballast to the portfolio. Unfortunately, commodities still negative, double-digit, and REITs, these are real estate investment trusts, um, still negative, double-digit. So with that, let's transition into performance on a value versus growth basis. And I already alluded to this, but on a year-to-date basis, we are still seeing growth significantly outperform value. So all of these growth categories, pretty much 20% above uh, their corresponding value counterparts. Um, so the, Market's definitely favoring still growth, although most recently, not quite as much, but still uh, still a tilt. And we can see this with the sectors. Is that correct, uh, Jonathan? Yeah, absolutely. So if we look at Q3 returns, we'll, you see on the value side that energy um, was down during the quarter. And, and we saw some modest returns um, uh, among many of the value segments and, and really all the growth segments were up. So growth still, uh, did better than value, but maybe not as much of a difference on a Q3 basis. But when we look at the year to date, that's where we can clearly see it. Uh, financials are still down 20%. That's the largest component uh, within value. And we're looking at technology returns that are up in aggregate almost 30%, consumer discretionary up about 25%. And those are the two biggest components within the growth style. Mm -hmm. Well, and we can see this too on, on our next slide where we have the industry returns and, and just the impact that COVID has had on, on these specific industries. Absolutely. So on the far left, we're looking at on, online retail, home improvement, technology, groceries. So shift in, in uh, terms of what people could do. And so these industries benefited. And then when we look on the far right, uh, many of these are more value-oriented industries. So energy down 48%, and that has to do with demand being down, pricing being down, airlines obviously being impacted, hotels, resorts, and cruise lines impacted. But again, as I mentioned, uh, the financial services area has been very impacted. Banks are still down 35% um, when you look at just the bank components. So again, most of these areas are more value oriented. Hmm. So what does it look like as we kind of broaden out and think more globally um, for both kind of the quarter and year to date? What, what has performed the best, let's say for the quarter on a global basis? Yeah, when we look at that, uh, certainly if you look on the far left, we're, we're seeing better numbers out of China uh, and Asia. And then if we look kind of at Latin America, that, that's still down. I, I think some of that is a bit COVID related, but uh, Latin America also has a lot of commodity exposure. And, and so that certainly impacted them. And then if you look at, at Europe, um, you'll see that uh, returns are positive, but uh, less so than the other regions of the world. And, and here again, when we look at it on a year to date basis, um, you can see clearly that Asia um, has uh, done better. Latin America, again, because of commodities are, are down sharply. And then when we look at the far right and, and we look at Europe, um, Europe obviously was very affected by COVID. We've seen resurgences uh, and, and those markets are still down on a year-to-date basis. Now in the emerging markets shown here, um, one, one thing to point out, a lot of emerging markets is a combination between Latin America and, and Asia, um, but on a combined basis, emerging markets really hasn't done that bad. Um, and part of that, though, is what, the weakening U.S. dollar for the year? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, well, how about bonds? Um, how have bonds performed for the year and, and really for the quarter, and, and where are we seeing the best performance? 
Yeah, so when we look at bonds in the third quarter, pretty much up across the board, we look on the left, emerging market, high yield. Uh, what we saw were credit spreads kind of narrowed. Um, municipals, um, you know, continued to recover. Uh, tips because of certainly inflation fears uh, due to money printing. Uh, inflation expectations are starting to come up, so we, we definitely saw those do well. But when we look at it on a year-to-date basis, clearly uh, those on the far right, which are more interest rate related, have, have done well. And so we, we look at treasuries uh, in aggregate up to 12%. But when we think of the 30-year treasury as an example, that was up almost 24%. And, and so with COVID, the recession, we saw interest rates uh, decline so far this year. It's just hard to imagine the 30-year treasury is up 20 plus percent. I mean, I suspect a lot of that was attributable to the first few months or, or kind of last part of the first quarter, beginning part of the second quarter, where the credit markets froze and, mm -hmm. and you know, treasuries were really the only game in town. Yeah, absolutely. Now, within the last couple of weeks, we have seen the 10-year treasury come up a little bit. So that bears watching. Okay. Which on the flip side, then, treasury prices have gone down a little bit. Just a little bit, yes. Okay. Well, good. With that, let's talk about Silver Oak's outlook. So we've gone through a discussion about the economy. We went through a discussion about the markets. But what is our outlook um, as it relates to, to these items? So for the U.S. economy, we're saying that we're obviously recovering from a brief, but, and I don't think this is uh, an exaggeration, an exceptionally sharp economic contraction. And frankly, when you shut down the economy, um, I don't know how you could get any worse than that. Um, so things are looking less bad. Um, but we still remain well below kind of historical averages, as uh, Jonathan has pointed out. And as we've mentioned, you know, one of the central themes of today's discussion is COVID. So I think a lot of the remaining recovery um, is going to be dependent upon the progression of COVID, therapeutics, and vaccines. Um, and whether that means that we're back to pre-COVID levels in, in mid-2021 or late-2021 or even pushing into 2022, I think these, these uh, items around COVID are really going to uh, answer that question. On the international economy, there's pretty much the same theme. Um, the only difference, I guess, here, Jonathan, is we are seeing parts of Europe suffer some pretty significant resurgences in, um, in COVID and therefore uh, back to somewhat draconian uh, shutdowns across parts of Europe. Correct. And then on the other hand, uh, we've seen Asia, China do a bit better. Uh, the only thing I noted was that uh, like the US, they're seeing more of a pickup in manufacturing and durables than they are in consumer spending. Uh, Okay. Well, and that's kind of a theme too, the manufacturing theme. Um, I mean, we had started to see manufacturing come back pre-COVID, but I would say at, you know, relatively modest levels, but nonetheless starting to improve. It looks like COVID just has, has really accelerated that trend, uh, both in the U.S. and pretty much worldwide. And then, of course, the big issue here is uh, pointing out activity that's occurring with the central banks. Um, so it's not just the Federal Reserve here in the U.S., but really central banks across the, the, the globe. And the fact that they've all been very, very supportive, but is more going to be needed. Um, and I, I kind of asked that somewhat with the answer embedded in it, because I think most people believe that more is needed. Although, again, there is the argument that maybe we wait a while and see, at least in the U.S., if what's been allocated already um, is needed because it's not all yet spent. So let's get to the markets and our equity outlook. Uh, 
And of course, uh, fiscal and monetary policy is likely to continue to influence asset returns. I think, um, in my personal opinion, uh, that current market levels are where they are almost entirely because of these two items, fiscal and monetary policy. I mean, to think that we are in the midst of a once in a century global pandemic and our equity markets are back to all time highs really defies all logic with the exception of knowing that there's $6 trillion in the system today that wasn't there in the beginning of March through fiscal and monetary policy and maybe another two or three trillion going into the system as a result of, of the most recent negotiations between the parties. Um, I mean, it's hard to believe that fiscal and monetary policy is not going to continue to influence asset returns. And therefore, the lack of fiscal or monetary policy could also influence the direction of those returns. Anything you'd like to add on that, Jonathan? No, other, other than the fact that, you know, we are seeing, as we mentioned, improvements, but, you know, we'll get into this a little bit later, but the markets are up on valuation, and, and I think a lot of that has been the stimulus. Sure. Now, you know, again, hopefully we'll see a bounce in earnings and continued improvement there, uh, but as you pointed out, a lot of that's going to probably do be dependent upon um, COVID and our ability to restart all parts of the economy and just not certain parts of the economy. And of course, uncertainty remains. We've touched on most of these. Um, the one thing we really haven't touched on is the election. Um, and that is almost territory that's uh, taboo to even get into. There's such a divide in the country between um, the candidates and the parties. Um, all I can say is uh, I love what I do because we have clients, and you know this, Jonathan, and, and I'm sure all of our clients are well aware of it. We have clients that are at both extremes, and I love having the perspective of both sides to, to hear the arguments on both. And I think last night was a, was a great, um, uh, I guess, uh, a way to see that. It really represented the fact that we have two candidates that have pretty different opinions and, and perspectives. Um, and neither one may be right or wrong. It just it is nice to see that we can have a discussion a little bit more, uh, I guess, uh, civil as we did last night versus the, <laughs> the first debate. Um, but as we've discussed, back to the markets, growth valuations do certainly seem stretched. And at some point, we believe the value, the international, and even small cap are likely to rotate back into favor. Not saying that that's going to happen anytime soon, as in the next month or even next quarter or so, but we do anticipate there to be a rotation back and that real assets are likely well positioned if uh, deficit spending spurs some inflation that, uh, that Jonathan talked about earlier. And of course, with such a wide dispersion of potential outcomes, we do highly recommend people remain diversified, which includes owning some bonds. So what's happening in the bond markets here and, and what do we think uh, as far as our outlook, Jonathan? Well, you know, the Fed has put unprecedented level of, of uh, liquidity into the bond markets. And so we saw that bond markets have uh, more or less recovered. We've seen interest rates come down. Um, and as a result, we've seen relatively good bond performance. You know, they'll continue to offer protection. But, you know, from these levels, if we see the economy continue to improve, then, then certain certainly credit or oriented or corporate bonds, you know, those spreads could narrow more. Um, and the Fed, on the other hand, has said on the short end of the curve, they're going to keep rates low or zero at zero through 2023. Um, but the other side is if we do see more growth uh, in the next year or so, we could see interest rates start to tick up a little bit. Sure. So maybe a steepening of the yield curve where the short end stays low, the longer end might go up a little. 
Yeah, and that's a great point because if that happens, that typically uh, is good for banks. Hmm. I and, value. Yeah, yeah, right. As as they borrow at you know the shorter end of the curve and then lend at the longer end of the curve, and if the economy is improving, and again that would help value uh, if that occurs. Sure. All right. Well, with that. Let's talk about our perspectives on the recent trends that we've seen. And oh, looks like we've got a slight issue. There we go. All right. So we mentioned earlier, Jonathan, this uh, this disconnect between Main Street and Wall Street, or at least we referenced Main Street. Um, and, and this is really showing why there's such a stark contrast between Main Street and Wall Street. If we look to the right of this chart, we're kind of seeing Wall Street, right? The S&P 500, and that's the makeup of the sectors within the S&P. Whereas the middle and the left bar represent either employment or GDP, and how much each sector represents of those categories. And the two that are pretty, um, distinctly different it's technology and financial services can you walk us through those two yeah absolutely so we'll start with technology it's 39 percent of the s p 500 you can see that on the far right but if you look at the far left and look under gdp you'll see that technology actually makes up only six percent of, of the economy and two percent of labor now that means that that essentially with 2% labor, these are very profitable companies, but they make up 39% of the S&P. Um, so in, in a way, they, they're being over-representative uh, compared to the Main Street side. On the other side, though, let's look at financial services. So here, if we start on the left side or the Main Street side, you'll see that they make up 23% of GDP 6% of labor, meaning these are good profitable companies, but they only make up 12% of the S&P currently. Now, obviously they've been impacted by COVID, but I, I think clearly um, they're, they're at half of, of what they represent uh, as part of the economy. So that, that's kind of what we're seeing with the S&P. And we're gonna see in a few minutes that the S&P even has more, uh, there's even more to this story because within that technology sector, there's really five stocks that are driving a big component of the overall S&P returns. And I, I think we have a slide or two that's gonna lay that out here in a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. In the meantime, this next slide is showing valuations. And, and this is honestly kind of scary when I look at it in the sense that, uh, we're saying to the far right, that dark gray line, that is current valuations, at least forward looking on a PE basis. And this is telling us, Jonathan, that right now we're at about 21 and a half and the 25 year average is about 16 and a half. Yeah, and pre-COVID it was at about 19. So it's actually more highly valued today than it was even in February. But again, it, it's the fiscal stimulus, it's the Federal Reserve providing liquidity that has kind of gone into the confidence in the market. Sure. And this next slide is gonna show us essentially the same thing, where we see that the US markets are kind of above their historical PE averages. That's I think in green, um, I'm colorblind, but I'm pretty sure. That's correct, yep. That's green. And then we also though are showing the international developed markets and then the emerging markets, which tend, which tend to be more Latin America and, and Asia. And even those markets um, are, or at least the emerging markets is, is above its, its average. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's looking at trailing earnings. But so the interesting thing, is the trailing earnings are, are the lines. But if you look at the diamonds, that's going on uh, forward um, valuation. And so there you can see with the green line, it's still well above that diamond. Whereas when you look at um, the emerging market and um, uh, the developed markets, 
they're really kind of more within their averages or, or much more close than, than we are, are seeing in the U.S. So that's a good point. So if I compared the green diamond to the green dotted line, the diamond is well above the green dotted line, correct? Correct, yeah. So that is saying forward PE of the U.S. is kind of overvalued from its historical average. If I look at the light blue diamond relative to the light blue dotted line, developed markets maybe certainly not overvalued relative to their historical average. Mm -hmm. uh, and the emerging market diamond relative to the emerging market dotted line, the dark blue, um, that one's also a little bit under, but not quite as much as we see in the developed markets, the international developed markets. Right. Okay. All right, that's that's very interesting. So that would tend to believe, if you believe in these cycles, and, and I certainly believe all parts of the market are cyclical, that going forward, we hopefully would see some improvement with regards to international performance relative to the U.S., and maybe even more so in the developed markets relative to emerging markets. Okay. Now, this slide is getting back to the U.S., and maybe we have these slightly out of order, but um, this is really important because I don't think people recognize, I certainly didn't appreciate it until we started looking at the numbers, the magnitude of how just a couple of stocks can really have an impact on the overall performance of even an index like the S&P 500. But what you're showing here is that the red line being the top five performing stocks in the S&P, they were up 35% on a year-to-date basis, correct? Correct, yes. And the other 495 stocks are actually down 3%. Mm -hmm. That's pretty astonishing, which then gets us to the blended performance of the overall S&P of just up 4%. Yeah, on a price basis. Yep, that's correct. Yep. Wow. Yeah, and those five stocks, the big obvious ones like the Amazons, Alphabet, Facebook. Apple, Facebook, and what's the fifth one? Microsoft? Microsoft, yes. Yep. So if you aren't weighted in those, you're really not participating in kind of this overall recovery that we've seen. And with 495 stocks still negative, and I actually heard a statistic just a couple of days ago uh, from one of the analysts, I think at Schwab, that 40% of the S&P 500 is still in a bear market, meaning down 20% from its all-time highs. But that just really is astonishing. Mm -hmm. hmm. Very interesting. Well, let's go to the next slide where we're going to see how those five stocks kind of represent the S&P 500 index. Yeah, so here they're they're about 24% of the index, and if we go back um, to 2000, the the top five stocks at that point were up 18%, were represented 18% of the index. So uh, it looks like we're kind of at at an extreme again. So just to remind everybody, in the late 90s, right, that was built up to the technology bubble bursting in 2000. Now we're not necessarily saying that there's going to be a uh, technology bubble bursting. But it is, uh, uh, again, a little concerning to, to think that we're that far above even the levels in 1999. Now, one counter to this is that in 1999, the weighting of the technology sector in the S&P 500 was more than twice that sector's contribution to earnings per share of the S&P 500. So how much weighting technology made of the S&P was twice its earnings per share contribution. Today, the weighting is only slightly more 
than those companies' earnings per share contribution to the S&P. Meaning back in the late 90s, these companies weren't making any money, right? Today, right. they actually make money. Yeah, and in fact, on our next slide, um, we're, we can kind of see that actually. So on, on this slide, we're, we're showing you the percentage market cap that these top five are, but we then show their percentage of earnings. And, and so again, these are good companies. Their earnings have been going up. This isn't like 2000, where many of those companies didn't have revenues or earnings. Right. But it still is, it still is, uh, you know, I think something that we need to watch, and that is how much they are making up of the overall S&P. All right. With that, let's talk a little bit more about the growth value discussion. And in this slide, when I first looked at it, it was a little confusing to me, Jonathan, but basically what we're showing here is the gray area or the uh, blue, I guess, maybe blue or gray, wh whichever yeah, color. Blue. Yeah. Okay, light blue. Those are periods in which growth is outperforming value. Correct. And the line, if the line is low, that means growth is really outperforming value. If the line is high, it means that value is outperforming growth. Is that fair? That is fair, yes. So getting back to our discussion that growth seems to be kind of at a high level, we see that by looking at the blue line and how it is so low and how really the last you know, 10 plus years have favored growth and now like really, really favoring growth. True. Absolutely. And, and if anything, it, it's not just the growth side, it, it's somewhat the value side. And, and that's reflecting what's going on in, in our COVID economy. Okay. So what do I infer from all that we've talked about in this growth versus value discussion? Um, we didn't really point it out when we think of our outlook, but are we favoring value now given how growth seems to be overvalued, or are we maintaining a more neutral position between the two? Well, we, in terms of our allocations, we, we still are more neutral, but what we're kind of seeing is that we'll probably still see good performance from growth companies. Again, technology companies are doing well, but value companies and some of those industries have been very impacted by COVID. And what we could see with a vaccine and an economic recovery is that we see kind of a snapback in those value companies. And we're not necessarily arguing that we're going from the low point where we are currently all the way back to where we were in 2007, but kind of more in that midpoint, you know, at 100. Sure, okay. All right. Well, with that, let's talk about small cap. And uh, I know we're kind of closing in on our time. We've got a few more slides to go through. But all we're showing here is that typically as you're coming out of a recession into the recovery phase, small caps tend to outperform large caps. That's not what's happened so far because I don't think we're far enough into, into the cycle. But typically that's what we would see, small caps outperforming large caps. Also, oh, let's see if we can get this slide to pull up correctly. There we go. Also, what we're seeing here is that the U.S. obviously really since the Great Recession has by far outperformed international. But based on several of the discussions we've had so far today, you can see that we do have some optimism looking forward on the international markets. and, and I mean, just by the pure nature of this chart, you're seeing that the international markets are by far less overvalued and maybe even slightly undervalued, certainly relative to the U.S. counterparts. So this is maybe one of the most important slides that we have for today's discussion. 
And we've shown this slide, I think the last two webinars. Um, we always tend to show it more often as we lead up to an election. And this is just pointing to the fact that as you're making market decisions, decisions that are in that bottom right circle, we really have to be careful of allowing our politics or the economic data to overly influence those decisions. I know at the time it may seem obvious, it may seem um, maybe even imprudent not to allow your politics or the thinking of the economy not to influence your market decisions, but we just know based on history, that is very, very dangerous. Um, and a lot of people don't understand the interplay between these, but if you give me any economic data point, I'm pretty much gonna prove that that's backward looking. It's last month, last quarter, last year. The markets are forward looking. So using economic data is like driving using your rear view mirror. It just doesn't work. And there's a, a million examples of how that interplays between politics and the markets as well. So I just encourage people as we're coming up to the year end, not to let politics or economic data overly influence their market decisions. More so, we think the markets are gonna be impacted by COVID. And again, that's been the theme throughout today's discussion. COVID is gonna more than likely have a greater impact on market performance over the next six to 12 months than would the US elections. As a matter of fact, if we go back historically, it really doesn't much matter. Um, we talked last time, you can find data supporting a slight tilt toward the markets uh, favoring Democrats or a slight tilt toward the markets favoring Republicans. But all in all, it really doesn't seem to make much difference. And of course, this is showing that market performance of stocks and bonds during election years. Okay, so typically we're seeing positive performance pretty much across the, the board, regardless of, of party. The one thing that we do know is that there is a high cost for setting out. So you're seeing here the green is if you were fully invested during this whole period. In red, if you were only invested during Republican presidencies, and blue, only invested during Democrat presidencies. And the point is not to compare the Democrat versus the Republican, but to compare both of them to just being fully invested. And honestly, that is what makes the difference. So with that, let's take the last few minutes and go through Biden's tax proposal. And in doing this, we are not necessarily saying this is good or bad. We're just giving you the facts right off of the Biden website. We consolidated all the information and then we went out and fact checked it against the website. Um, and, and you know, there's no arguing that he said he wants to raise corporate taxes. All right, so we definitely see an impact there. He also has said that he'd like to increase social security taxes by basically eliminating the income cap on those making $400,000 or more. So you'd pay social security tax um, on essentially all of that income. That's kind of a big one because social security tax, especially for self-employed, is 12.4% plus. Um, that, that could be a big revenue generator. And I don't think there's probably enough discussion around the impact that might have. And then of course, the higher individual tax rates, restoring the top rate back to 39.6, capping deductions, increasing capital gains on those that are making a million dollars or more, not fully restoring the SALT deduction. I think his earlier plan had that being restored. This most recent plan uh, does not fully restore the SALT deduction. And then it eliminates some other deductions on retirement accounts. 
and of course, higher estate taxes. And, and this, for folks that are wealthier with more assets, could be really impactful. As a matter of fact, we're doing a lot of year-end planning for clients that have greater than $6 million per person or, or uh, uh, $12 million, say, as a couple. Um, the possible opportunities include slats, grats, irrevocable trust, charitable trust. I mean, there's a number of, of items. All of them come with their own pros and cons, uh, but we are having a lot of discussions as year-end approaches and then into early next year around these items. Okay, with that, our last section is just the Silver Oak updates and reminders. I mentioned earlier, we are still working under our business continuity plan, but we do have a few more team members coming into the office. We're trying to do it in a very safe fashion, in a very slow fashion. We are also having some in-person meetings, but we're only doing those in kind of a safe social distancing environment, wearing masks, et cetera. The great news is we did complete our global optimization project. And therefore, most of our clients are going to be seeing over the next six months or so, us asking for updated risk tolerance questionnaires and updated investment policy statements accordingly. And then we have a series of year-end reminders just to keep in your kind of forefront of your thinking. Um, the two that really stand out for me is watch for year-end capital gain distributions. We're certainly watching out for those for our clients. And then with year end coming, uh, considering using low basis stock for any charitable donations. And then just a few other noteworthy items with year end. There's been some adjustments to annual contribution rates and things of that nature. All right, if there are any additional questions, I encourage you to reach out to your Silver Oak advisor. We're always here, happy to answer those questions. If you're not working with an advisor, you can contact me directly at 952-896-5701. And also remember, if you do have topics that you'd like us to discuss next time, to bring those to our attention and we'll make sure to add them to the next webinar. With that, have a wonderful day.